Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is best-selling author Laura Littman. It's so nice to have you here, Laura. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. You have such an exciting career. You know, exciting is such an interesting word because, you know, you know as a writer, it's the least exciting thing, you know. You, it, it's something you do in a room by yourself or in a coffee shop on a laptop, and I love it, and I'm deeply gratified that I get to do it for a living. But exciting is not the word I put to it. I mean, right? It seems like the most plodding existence in some ways. You know, you just the amassing of eighty thousand to a hundred thousand words, which is about what a novel is. It just it, it it's like watching paint dry. <laughs> You actually started out in the newspaper business, worked for the Baltimore Sun for several years. Your father was an editor there. When you look back at some of the stories you wrote early in your career, which one can you point to that had the most impact on you personally and professionally? I think there was a story that taught me how important it was to be lucky. And interestingly, it happened in my career in San Antonio after I'd spent 72 hours being beaten like a drum by the other paper. I was lucky enough to come through journalism at a time where mm -hmm. it was possible to work in a two newspaper town and I did that in San Antonio and I was new and I was green and there had been a horrible, horrible crime in which some boys played hooky and having run out of things to do about noon or so, they decided to go rape and kill one of their classmates' mothers and I was just as I said, beaten like a drum by mm -hmm. the police reporter on the other paper who was a veteran, he was almost a front page kind of character. And by Monday, by the time the weekend was over, I'd done so poorly that my editors didn't even have it in their heart to like really be mad at me. They just pitied me. And they sent me down to the school board in the area of town where this had happened. And it was really far out. This is a long time ago, mm -hmm. like no cell phone. So mm -hmm. you have to go call in from a pay phone. And I was waiting in, in an ice house down south of San Antonio, waiting for the phone, waiting for the payphone, just making polite chit-chat with the family. And I asked them if they knew the woman, and they sort of said in a very guarded way that, they yes, they knew of her. And I said, well, you must be horrified, you must be upset. And there was a 14-year-old boy sitting there, and he looked up and he said, I told Mike not to do it. He said, are you telling me that mm -hmm. you were given information? Because I was the third boy. I was with them stay here, I'm going to go. And of course it was a huge story that I had found this kid and I got this first-hand account of what happened that day. And as I said, the lesson there was that I was lucky, you know, that I was in the right place at the right time and that you can never discount luck and that a moment like that can change your life. I honestly believe that if I had not had the good fortune to be in that position, I probably really would have foundered in my journalism career. I would have been marked as the new reporter who screwed up so badly. It would have been so hard to come back from it. And this kind of brought me back to even. And you know, a lot of the novels I write are about the people who catch luck the other way, mm -hmm. who catch the mm -hmm. bad luck. They're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or they do something that doesn't seem like a big deal and it goes horribly out of control and they can't take it back. So. You know, yeah, I look back at that as is, is probably one of the most pivotal moments of my adult life. Mm -hmm. What have you learned as a journalist, technically speaking, that helps you as a novelist? Well, it teaches you to be a professional. You, you know, you understand deadlines. You understand that you work even when you don't feel like it, that you don't, if you're going to meet those deadlines, you can't afford to be self-indulgent and wait for the muse to show up. I know some people who suffer from a disease that I've dubbed first authoritis. There are mm -hmm. all sorts of, I've had moments of it myself, but one aspect of first authoritis that I never had was I never wanted to be a temperamental diva. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, it turns out that's what they've been waiting for, mm -hmm. that they have this romance of the creative person as being kind of unreliable and crazy and just out there because they're so creative. Um, journalism will knock that out of you pretty fast <laughs> if you're ever inclined that way. And it also, you know, it taught me how to be very efficient about research. Mm -hmm. I don't, um, I don't romanticize research that much as a, as a novelist. It's, you know, my job really is to make stuff up and I do some research and I'm proud of what I do because I do think it enhances the credibility of my books. But I'm just as proud of the stuff I just sit in a room and make up. You've said that many times that your stories have been inspired by real life events. What sort of creative license do you allow yourself? Uh, tons. <laughs> the more the better. Because the one thing I don't want people to think that I do is sort of do the easy thing of here's this famous story and everybody knows it, so you're going to kind of fill in the gaps and I'm just going to trade on the idea that you think you're getting some juicy gossip from behind the scenes. While most of the stories I've written about have been from the news, they've usually been stories from my youth that I call it like the pre-CNN era. Mm -hmm. So these stories of missing girls, um, sexual predators who you know kidnap and rape their victims, yes, they were drawn from real life stories, but most people don't know them. Now most people outside the Baltimore, Washington area wouldn't know the source of any story I've mm -hmm. ever written. Let's talk about Tess, because I mean, she's great. She start, we meet her in Baltimore Blues, and now what, just 11 novels? That, yes, there have been 11 books about her. And one in progress, I'm guessing? I have not yet come back to Tess. I do have a short story coming out, but I was too clever by half when I had her have a baby. <laughs> and I have not figured out what her world looks like post-child, and how do I honor sort of the covenant of the suspense novel, which is that it be suspenseful, that characters end up in jeopardy without having people feel as if she's being reckless in a way that they can no longer support. Mm -hmm. Tess is a former reporter. She worked for the Baltimore Star. Just how autobiographical are these stories? Tess is, in terms of her biography, the facts of her life, who her parents are, where she was born, the kind of household she grew up in, is really nothing like me. Mm -hmm. And that was to some degree deliberate. I think I understood early on that if I were successful, if I did publish, there would be an assumption that True. I was Tess, Tess was me. And I was okay with that. What I wasn't okay with was dragging my parents and my sister into it. <laughs> they didn't sign on for that. So yeah. I made Tess an only child and her parents could not be more different from my parents she is quintessentially Baltimorean in a way that I am not, you know, with a father who is Irish Catholic, a mother who's Jewish, with these long, deep roots in the city and its politics. I wasn't even born there. I, you know, moved mm -hmm. there when I was six years old, and my dad took a job at the Baltimore Sun. But Tess Monahan and I agree on virtually everything. I have better impulse control, which would make <laughs> me a much more boring protagonist in a novel, and. I think I'm a little more diplomatic than she is. Yeah. I've learned the cost of speaking one's mind, mm -hmm. and I and I would you know be careful about stating my opinions as frankly as Tess does. Sometimes she can be a little bit inconsiderate of others, but when it comes to music, when it comes to our worldviews, we're very much alike. Except I am not allergic to shellfish. <laughs> Thank goodness. Huh? What are the advantages and disadvantages of writing in a series? Well, the advantage is that you know the world, you've created it, and so there's a little bit less heavy lifting to do when you come back to it. That said, the problem is that if you want the series to go on, it's hard to take a book or a character on that complete journey that I think gives readers the greatest satisfaction of yes, that was mm -hmm. a story well told and a story that took me to a final destination. Because it cannot. It has to be open-ended. So what you're writing are these discrete chapters within a character's life. Mm -hmm. I've written over a million words about Tess Monahan, And the changes in her life are incremental. I can't use her up 
And so when I write books about people other than Tess, I get to put them through the ringer. I get to put them through <laughs> much more full arcs. And, and then I can't come back to them. I'm really, I'm done with most of the characters that I've written about in the non-Tess books. But even in the non-Tess books, she sometimes shows up. Oh, I miss her. I'm thinking of the most dangerous thing. And, you know, we're going through this wonderful story and, and compelling story, and suddenly there's Tess. And it was a wonderful little uh, cameo appearance for her. I resisted that for a long time. But the crossovers actually began, I want to say, as early as the... Um, I'd written my first standalone, which was Every Secret Thing, and then the very next Tess book, there was one of the characters from Every Secret Thing, and at first was, well, okay, well, the characters from the standalones can cross into Tess's world, but she can't leave, and I was like, no, I don't see a reason for that either. <laughs> well, your standalone books have led critics to say that not only are you a fine mystery writer, you're just a plain, fine literary writer. How do you deal with that distinction? Because it seems to me that almost everything you write is literary, and almost everything you write has an element of mystery to it. I really love the crime novel, and while I am wildly flattered when people say that I transcend the genre, I'd like to tweak the language a little bit. And I don't feel like I levitate above the plane of crime writing because it contains some really great writers. But I feel that I work in the border country. Mm -hmm. I think that the boundaries between genre fiction and what people call literary fiction are not that well defined, that, and that there are these sort of unmarked territories where people are coming at them from either side. I'm clearly coming from the crime side. I love writing about crime because I feel like it's one of the best ways to examine mm -hmm. a society, a community. Mm -hmm. It's kind of ripped the polite face off of, of a community, and secrets come out. Um, other uncomfortable things have to be dealt with, like class and race, money. I, you know, I love writing about money, which I think is a much neglected topic in a lot of literary mm -hmm. fiction. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of you know, start heading toward the boundaries and I'm coming from the crime fiction area, and you know, along the way, well, you know, there's Richard Price, who's clearly come from the literary side of things, but is interested in mm -hmm. not the procedural part of the police procedural, but he's really interested in police and how they do their job and how their work defines them and what they know about a city from the virtue of being out there. So I, I never make any claims for my own work. That's just not mm -hmm. for me to say. But I know that my genre in the right hands has no limitations. Mm -hmm. I, oh. Yeah, I just feel I'm really kind of, you know, a booster of crime fiction and like a real cheerleader, like, go crime writers, go. <laughs> well, certainly we have all kinds of elements in The Most Dangerous Thing, that we have the, the, the page turner kind of feel to it, but also that resonance of deeper meaning. And I was haunted, Laura, after I finished this book. Did it leave you feeling haunted too? It's a really hard book to leave behind. And I think in particular for me and for some other people I've heard from, there's this character of Gogo, -Go, the character mm. who dies in the very first chapter. And the exercise of the book, if you will, is can I make people feel for this person they never got to know in life? Is that possible? Because that's really what I'm asking of the reader. Can you feel sorrow and empathy for this haunted, damaged man? who's made so many mistakes and has, and has hurt a lot of people in his own way. You know, he's, he's hurt his wife and his children and he's hurt himself, you know, his brothers, his friends. And, you know, that's what I was hoping for, you know. And I'm haunted by a lot of my characters. I feel very strongly that novelists have a responsibility to have full empathy for their creations. You know, if, if we don't have empathy for them, then no one can. Mm -hmm. If we can't see them as fully human, then they're not. You've described this book as your most autobiographical novel. How so? It's in terms of geography. It is placed in the neighborhood where I grew up, in, a, in a, an imaginary house that would be a little bit down the street where there was no house. Mm -hmm. But other than that, every detail of where these five characters as children run and play and explore, that's, that's all taken from my life and, and the time. 
no one I've met can quite agree on when it stopped, just that it did stop. But there was a time in childhood where people, you know, left in the morning and came home for dinner. And, you know, strangely, it was a time when we had less communication mm -hmm. in terms of tools. And now kids are more scheduled. The idea that you would just sort of wander out the back door and not come home until supper, unheard of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This book takes place in the past and the present. Why is that such an effective technique for you? I think that what I found about sort of hopscotching through time, not to be too technical on the craft side of things, it's a really effective way to pace a novel. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it keeps people sort of on their toes and like you get them very interested in what's going on in the present, like, aha, but now come with me yeah. to the past. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, well, oh, and now I'll take you here. And if you're doing it right, and again, I never claim I'm doing it right, but the hope is everyone's just interested enough and then they're, inter you know, and you've sort of, it's a, it's a really, um, it's a sleight of hand in a way. Mm -hmm. It's a way to control the narrative and to hold off certain questions and resolutions mm -hmm. like no not not yet first we must go here and you know I also think it's the way our memories work we don't actually think in flashback you know flashback is a cinematic technique where you know you see a character mm -hmm. sitting mm -hmm. there at the table and all of a sudden <laughs> and they're, but our memories are always coming at us from every different direction and they're jostled by such strange things I've I've been had this feeling just 48 hours ago, because it happened that I flew out of the airport in DC instead of the airport in Baltimore. And I'm crossing the Potomac River, and all of a sudden, here is this memory. My father started off as a Washington correspondent, and it's the memory of, we used to drive across this bridge to pick up my father, and he worked in this building, and there was a wood, Woodward and Lothrop on the first mm -hmm. floor, and we drove around waiting for him to come out, and my sister and I played a game in which Whoever yelled out first got to have the dress in the window, and the dress in the corner window was always the dress. And you, went, <laughs> you couldn't call out for it until you saw it. That would be cheating. All of this just came over me because I looked at the Potomac River, and yeah. that's how everyone's mind works. Yeah. You know, didn't the Greeks call that the historical present? They might have. I don't know. I think you're better read than I am on no, such things. No, no, no. Would you use the same framework for your latest novel and when she was good? Oh, this is a powerful book. Tell us about Heloise, past and present. Heloise Lewis is an American every woman. She's self-employed. She's worried about the economy. She's a single mom. She wants to have a civilized relationship with the father of her only child, but it's really hard sometimes. And she also happens to be an extremely high-priced call girl, mm -hmm. madam, living in a very sweet, pleasant suburb somewhere between Baltimore and Annapolis. How does a madam become an every woman? I think it's because of all the other things she is. Mm -hmm. you know, we're such a work-obsessed nation, mm -hmm. and we tend to identify ourselves and seek to know others through what they do. And we don't remember all the other parts of people, and yet I think people are parents, they're children, their siblings, their, we have all these other roles as well. And, you know, first and foremost, this is a woman who is her child's mother. Like if you ask her, mm -hmm. and if you ran it, like, who are you? She would say, I'm Heloise Lewis, I'm Scott's mom. Mm -hmm. Because that's her primary identity and everything she does is for him. And if she is working in an industry that people consider distasteful and unethical and of course is outright criminal, as far as she can tell it's the best choice she has. As you were writing this book, did you begin to look at that business a little differently? I know I did reading it. I really did and I had to sort of go through almost whiplash extremes where I got to the point where I was like, yes, it should be legal. And then I started really thinking about that and reading about it and realized that while in the utopian ideal, if we want people to have complete freedom to do with their bodies as they wish, well, yes, you would say this should be legal, but we don't live in a utopia. We live in a society where people exploit each other. And so if you legalize prostitution, 
then it makes it impossible to bring criminal charges mm -hmm. against those who force people into prostitution mm -hmm. because it's legal. So very vulnerable populations, which would include illegal immigrants, but also basically runaways. Mm -hmm. I just heard some horrible statistic about how the vast majority of runaways are approached by pimps and procurers probably within 48 hours on mm -hmm. the street. And these are very vulnerable populations. But yes, I would argue for decriminalization of the act of prostitution, but not for the act of promoting prostitution. You've been keeping company with Eloise for a number of years. Began with a short story called Scratch a Woman, mm -hmm. which was in the collection, hardly knew her. What is it about her that intrigues you so much? She started off almost as sort of like a one-joke character. The idea first occurred to me actually in 2001. Ha, 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 there's a suburban madam. She's the most ethical woman on the cul-de-sac. <laughs> yeah. But that was all I had. And that, you know, that, was, that would have been... I, I'm so glad I didn't try to write it then because all I had was sort of like that one not terribly original, not terribly funny joke. But then as I started thinking about, okay, what would this character be like? Where would she come from? How did she become this? And I was really interested. I mean, for me, I mentioned earlier how much I love to write about money <laughs> and, and jobs and what people do. What would you do in this economy if you were a 37-year-old woman with no college degree and you wanted to provide your son with a really nice upper middle class life. What job would be available to you? I mean, mm -hmm. the driving suspense in this novel is, sure, Heloise might be able to escape the life that she's living, but what's she gonna do next? What could she possibly do? Mm -hmm. And you notice, I think, in the book, that there comes a point where Heloise says she's tired of, how many more men are going to ask her that question? Mm -hmm. Because at least three different men in her life who, who know what she does are like, well, what would you do? And she's angry and frustrated, and she's also filled with self-doubt because she doesn't know what she could do. Well, and we meet some other women in the novel. We don't get to know them as well that, that she has in her employ, but they're wrestling with those same questions. It's true, and then it's also, I think, very important. Even though this character came late to the novel, came to one of the latest drafts and did not exist, the mother of her son's best friend, Coran, is yeah. presented as the stay-at-home mother who, in just one moment, has that, that spew moment where, you know, every now and then one of our friends, or personally I've done it, you just let go. It's just like <laughs> someone says, how are you? And you actually tell them. <laughs> you actually yeah. tell the yeah. truth. Yeah. And it's like the definite TMI moment. It just all comes burbling out. And, and then she's like, no, no, no. I, I have a good life. I should, you know, I actually just had this experience this week with a really good friend where she let go and expressed a lot of frustrations and concerns and this is and that's. And then later in the day, she said, I shouldn't have done that. You know, and, and, and I was like, I understand. I said, I understand on every level. Hmm. I understand that you needed to say it. And I understand that it's not as grave as it sounded when you did it. I get it because I've done the same thing myself. So, yeah, I mean, there are different women, and all of them are struggling. The men are struggling, too, in this novel. Oh, sure. And we should add that there's some wonderful suspense and some, some cliffhanger moments that are scary and kept me up late at night. Oh, and, dear. You know, but it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. I noticed in your acknowledgments you mentioned Donald Westlake. We've mm -hmm. had him on the show. He's a great guy. How has he influenced your work? Donald Westlake is such a hero of mine. First of all, he was amazingly prolific. Mm -hmm. It's my contention that each generation writes as fast as it has to. Westlake, um, Ed McBain, slash Evan Hunter, Lawrence Block came from a generation where if you were going to make a living as a writer, you needed to produce about 500,000 words a year, you know, in novels and short Why? stories. And so that's what they did, and they could do it. And then my generation, a book a year was the standard, and so that's what we do. And and now it's going back up again. That's what's really shocking me. Now all of a sudden people are saying, you know what, you might need to do two books a year. It's like, I don't think I can. <laughs> but so first of all, he was prolific. He was professional. You know, all of those things that I so prize. But one of the things that really impressed me about Westlake is he wrote two books about tabloid journalism. Trust me on this and Baby Would I Lie. Mm -hmm. I worked as a journalist for a long time, and I've read novels by newspaper people 
that did not feel as true to me as his work did about the newspaper business. And so when I got a chance to meet him, I said, those books are great. How did you do that? And he said, well, you know, I do a little bit of research, but I've always contended that if you really honor your own imagination, if you just sit there and think carefully about what you're creating, you're going to get it right. If you're following it logically, that you just, you understand more than you know that you understand. The last book I think Westlake wrote was about reality television. Mm -hmm. It was a Dortmunder, you know, his, his repeating yeah. character. Yeah. And it was great. And I would bet you he did the most cursory research possible on how to make a reality TV show because he really did have that gift of just think, think, and it'll, it'll happen. Speaking of prolific writers, you are a prolific writer, and we don't have a lot of time left, so I'd like to get your quick take on some of your other standalone titles, the kind of stuff that we don't read on the book covers. First of all, Life Sentences. Uh, Life Sentences is a book about the dangers of thinking you're the most fascinating person that you know. <laughs> okay, the, to the power of three. That is a book about how the first person to break a girl's heart is almost always another girl. That's a great one. I'd Know You Anywhere. I'd Know You Anywhere is a novel about the obligations of intimacy. Just because you know someone better than anyone else knows him, does that mean you owe him anything? We've alluded throughout the show to your use of autobiography and fiction. Have you ever thought about just writing an out-and-out -out memoir? No, because I have a very poor memory, and I've also promised my sister I would not, to which she said, could I have that in writing? Thank you so much for being with us, Laura. Oh, thank you. This has been a grand conversation. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud. <laughs>